Hello, everyone. My name is Razvan Bretoyo, and this is my colleague Darius Bogdan, and we are from Linify. Linify is a company uh, placed in Inclusion at Boca, and we started as a startup company, and right now we are a digital agency specialized in mobile and web application. Our history with serverless technologies started three years ago when uh, we, we used serverless uh, on our um, product. Can you raise your hand? How many people use serverless technologies till now? So, some, okay. So I know you're wondering what's about this title, how we process 50 terabytes of, of data per month using serverless technologies. How do you get this number, 50 terabytes? Well, actually, it's, it's a real number, and we, we process more than data on our project uh, that we developed for an uh, American company. The project was an analytics platform that aggregates marketing data for, from different providers like Facebook, Google Analytics, Google AdWords, Bing Ads. And uh, the users pull the data from these providers in our platform and then run different pipelines. So we process more than that without using any servers, without managing infrastructures, without thinking about the resources. So the platform was full serverless and was developed with almost the same technologies that we're gonna to present today in our demo. Okay, so in our work, our work agenda will be composed by, we'll start with our demo and we'll see how we're gonna to build today. And then we want, to, we want you to understand how serverless works. Then we, we, we see our pipelines, how they look like. Then we will talk about technologies that we use in our pipelines. We try to be as more as specific, but uh, we try to cover all the things here. And in the final, we write some code and we will prove you how it works. So let's jump to the demo and see and see what we build. So let's say we are um, a mayor of cluj -Napoca. I'm Emil Bok, and I want to create a metro here. So to, to do that, I want to, I want to have data regarding the traveling time between each neighborhood. So let's say I want to know how many, how, how uh, minutes I, uh, what is the travel time between Bunaziwa and Marasht. And uh, also I want this data to be for uh, the last three years, and also I want to add data every day. And uh, beside the, the average time, we want to calculate the maximum average travel time between two, two neighborhoods. So we know uh, what are the, those neighborhoods that have the, most, uh, the, the maximum average travel time. So here in our platform, you will see three cards. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the left one, you will see the card that we will show you the, the neighborhoods that have maximum average uh, travel time. Right now, we don't have any data, but we will add some. In the left one, you can select, uh, you can select uh, a neighborhood and the destination, and you will see the hours and the travel time uh, on each hour for, for the source and destination that you selected. So we really want to build this demo using cluj napoca data, but the problem is we, we didn't find such data. And uh, the only provider that give us uh, this data and good data is Uber. So we, our demo will be uh, using London and Paris data because they are much more data than Cluj Napoca. So let's, let's see how our pipelines works. We start uh, by adding a file. We'll add a, uh, a London uh, with travel time from London. And now I hope the internet is, is working. Yeah, so I think we need to switch that because it will take forever. But we are, we already registered this loading. So in this loading, you will see the demo using Paris data, which are much more bigger. So we upload a new file. You see the file is very big, it has 1.8 gigabytes, and it's all, uh, it has like 48 millions of rows of data. 
Okay, let's move forward. No. Should I just Okay, our file is uploaded and now our pipeline is started. We take the file and we will aggregate some data and in our final destination file we'll have a clean data that, that, that can query. So let's see. Okay, so here we are the we have right now we have the data, the pipeline is complete, and we will start querying our 48 million uh, rows from our table. And you will see that how fast it is. And now you can see the travel time uh, on each hour between two neighborhoods. Okay, so this data set contains 48 million uh, data of rows, and uh, it was aggregated by two, I think by two files. Okay, and now my colleague Darius will explain to us what it means to be serverless. Okay, so what is serverless? What are the main advantages and why should we use it? I will tell you what serverless is in my opinion and how it helped me. First, as a software developer, I want to focus on writing good quality code and deliver it fast to my customers. So the first advantage of serverless is that we have no infrastructure. That means that we can, we can focus on writing our code without needing to worry about the underlying infrastructure. So our code will run in the cloud and we don't need necessarily to know on which machine it runs on or we don't need to update the operating system, we don't need to manage that. The second advantage is automating scaling. Let's take a moment and think about that we have an application. It has ab around 10,000 users. Our server can manage that. And we do some marketing and one day we get a lot of attention. So in that day, one million users want to enter our application. What will happen then? Will our application be able to handle all the requests or will it crash? Well, using serverless, we don't need to ask these questions because everything is automatically scaled for us. So if our application will have peak hours of traffic, then more instances will be spawned. And after uh, we have less traffic, the instances will be stopped. And a big advantage of serverless is that it scales down to zero. What does that mean? By scaling down to zero, it means that if we don't have any traffic on our application, our server will not run. So we don't need to pay only, we will pay only for the time we are running our code. So if we have an application that runs uh, our code 20 minutes a day, we only pay for 20 minutes a day. We don't need to hold we don't need to pay for the whole period. This is different from having a virtual machine where our code maybe runs 20 minutes a day, but we, our server runs 24 server and we pay for the whole period. Okay, so we just presented serverless, but is serverless really serverless? It's not actually because they, there are servers behind it, but we don't need to manage that and that's the main advantage. We just write code and then we can deploy it with one simple command. Of course, we can do some configurations, but yeah. So thinking serverless. When starting to work with serverless, we need to know some things like cold start. What is cold start? Well, cold start means that because our application scales down to zero instances, at first, when a request comes in, we have no active instance. So it will take a little time until the, the application will start, maybe two seconds. But depending on your use case, this is not that important because if you have an application like we are going to present today where we want to process a lot of data, waiting two seconds at the first request doesn't matter because we are interested in analyzing and processing a lot of data. Another thing is time and memory limitation. When, uh, well, every provider has some limitation about this stuff. For example, Google Cloud Functions uh, have a timeout after nine minutes and the maximum memory is two gigabytes. But if you write our code good and we break it into more small parts, we shouldn't hit these limitations. 
for example, today we are going to process a lot of data and we can use these technologies without hitting these limitations. Next, di learning different technologies. At first, you will start maybe with a small service that is serverless, but you will see that after working a lot with it to gain, uh, to work with its full capacity, you will start to integrate more service because, for example, our pipeline for today will use a lot of services from Google that integrate really easy and nice. And, for example, when you have a virtual machine, you can keep your API and your database on the same server, but using serverless, we cannot do that because when it scales down to zero, we will lose all our data. So we need to think a little different. So let's see how our pipeline will look like. Well, our pipeline will start by uploading a file. That will trigger our pipeline when we upload a file. Then the first step of our pipeline will be to store that file somewhere. The second step of our pipeline will be to save our data into a data warehouse where we are able to analyze that data. We know how the files will come in in just a second, so the st third step will be to aggregate some more data to them. And the final step would be to update the final results. So this is how our fi file will look like in the beginning. We can see that we have so a source ID column and a destination ID column. They are uh, some IDs. We don't know what these IDs mean. And we have another table in the, into our data warehouse where we know the name for each location. This is what we are going to do in the third step. We are going to aggregate some more data because we don't want to show on the front end only some IDs because they don't mean anything. So that's why we have a third step in our pipeline to aggregate some more data. And you can see after we aggregate some data that we, we have two more columns, one with the source name and one with the destination name. Now that we know how our pipeline will look like, let's see what technologies we are going to use for that. The first technology we are going to use, because we want to upload files into our application, we are going to use Google Cloud Storage. Here we are going to keep all the files that contain raw data. After that, we are going to use for computing serverless functions. For that, we are going to use Google Cloud Functions. And for communicating between the functions, we are going to use Cloud Tasks, which is a distributed system for tasks. And for analytics, we are going to use BigQuery. Here we are going to store our data, and here we are going to analyze it. BigQuery is a data warehouse. Now that we know the technologies, let's see how this is going to apply on our pipeline. So we are going to enter on the front end page. There, when we upload a file, that file will be automatically uploaded to Google Cloud Storage. When that file finishes uploading, an event will trigger that will cause the first step of our uh, pipeline to start. And the first step is to just take that file, get its data, and store it into the, uh, our data warehouse, which is BigQuery. After that finishes, the second step will start to aggregate the data, which is another serverless function that will be triggered through Cloud Task, and so on. And at the end, we are going to have all our data into BigQuery to analyze it. We will, now, Razvan will talk in more detail about each of these services and how we can use them. OK, so that will show us that we're going to store the files into Google Cloud Storage. But let's see what is Google Cloud Storage and why we can use that. So Google Cloud Storage is a, it's an object uh, storage where we can store different things like media content, backups, archives, analytics data like we are doing today. Also, uh, for example, Spotify is storing their music using uh, Cloud Storage. It comes in three types is the standard one, which is used for serving uh, end content to the end user. So for example, images or different files. It has a type called Nearline, where you can store data which is accessed less than a month. And also they just released a new type called Coldline, which is used for data that is retrieved less than a year. So very rare data. Also it has a nice feature called multi-region availability. So if your app is global, uh, cloud storage will redundantly distribute uh, the content uh, around the globe, so, uh, so every user around the globe will have access very quick to your, to your data. Okay, now we know how to store the files. Let's see how to communicate between each step. 
because our steps should be executed in some order, we need some orchestration. For that, we're going to use Cloud Task, which is a distributed task queue. Cloud Task is, is very simple. You have queues and tasks. And when you want to create a task, you just, uh, you just create a task by specifying URL. The URL should be an endpoint from your application, which means the, your worker that will handle the task. And then you attach that task to a queue. And Cloud Task, we know how and when to dispatch the task and ping your worker. And your worker needs to do the job to complete the task. If your worker retrieves, uh, returns status 200, uh, the task is removed for queue. If the workers re return a bad error code, the Cloud Task will retry the task. Also, the task can be scheduled. So you can say, I want this task to be executed tomorrow in the morning. Also, I, like I said, the task can be retried. So you can configure uh, the queues by specifying a retry policy or by specifying how many tasks can be executed in parallel. So this is a very nice feature because think about if you have an app that uses a third-party API, and that uh, third-party API has some limitation, like concurrency. So you can connect more than, than 10 clients for your app to that uh, API. So you can use Cloud Task to throttle the request uh, to that API. Also, the price is very good. The first million uh, tasks are free. So, and then you only pay 40 cents per million per task. Now we know how to communicate, how to store the file, how to communicate between, between each step. Let's see how we develop each step. So in our architecture, each step is a cloud function. But let's see what, what means, what, what is a cloud function. So a cloud function is a function as a service which has an input, and it may uh, provide some output, or it can create some side effect. And a cloud function is automatically triggered when, so when some event is happening in the cloud. Let's see if cloud functions are truly serverless. So regarding the infrastructure, you don't need to manage anything. You are just focusing on your code. You just write your function, and then when you deploy to Google using their CLI, Google will handle all the stuff regarding infrastructure for you. They will uh, update uh, dependency. They will install software. They will do all, all the things. Right now, uh, Cloud Functions come in uh, Node.js 8, Node.js 10, uh, Python 3 and Go. And they have Node.js 6, which is already deprecated. Let's see if, uh, if uh, how about scalability. So when you deploy a function and you have a lot of requests coming to your, to your server, Google will create uh, as much as instances as you can, so we can, so we can uh, deliver the request to your, to your application. And also, you will pay only for what you use, which is means that after your, your spike of requests are gone, Google will scale down your function till, till zero instances. And you are not paying for the number of instances that are created or for number of the instances that are in idle. You are only paying for the time that the request is proceed. So if you write a good code and, and your requests are very small and very fast, your bill, your bill will be much smaller. Now let's see how we can trigger a cloud function. We have the most common use case where a cloud function can be an HTTP function. What that means? It means that when you deploy a function with HTTP, Google will automatically create an URL for you, will assign a domain, it will add a certificate SSL. And after that, you can ping your cloud function like a normal, normal endpoint. We have different use cases for, for HTTP functions, like webhooks. So for example, you create an app, you, you integrate uh, your payment provider with Stripe, and you want to create a webhook to, trigger, to be triggered every time a new transaction is made. So you can create an HTTP function and connect to Stripe. Also, it can be used to connect to different cloud providers, or Google Assistance, or uh, another third-party APIs. If you really want, you can create REST APIs using uh, HTTP functions. But we don't recommend that, because cloud functions should be, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't take care of all of your state. So if you really want to create a serverless REST API, you should use App Engine or Cloud Run. We will talk more about Cloud Run in the next slides. Now, Let's see what about the functions that are trigger, triggered in the background. Like we have in our, uh, in our demo, a function is triggered every time we upload the file. 
So for that, Google has Google Cloud Storage trigger, which, will be, which you can configure to trigger a cloud function when you add the file or when you remove a file from your bucket. You also can attach a cloud function to a PubSub. PubSub is a publish subscribe mechanism. So you attach a cloud function to a topic. And when somebody publish a message to that topic, the cloud function will be triggered. Also has integration with Firestore, which is a non-SQL database real time from Google. So you can trigger a cloud function when you add a document, when you remove a document, or when you update a document. And if you want to, to run the cloud function uh, on, a, on a cron job, you can use Cloud Scheduler. So we can, you can configure your function to be triggered, for example, every day, every weekly, every month, like you want. Now we talk about, uh, we define what is a cloud function. And let's see uh, how easy to develop a cloud function. And now my colleague Darius will, will show us how, we, how easy it is to develop and deploy a cloud function. Like Vorbez, go. OK, so we are going to write a cloud function in Node.js. For those of you who don't know Node.js, it's Node.js is we have here the package.json where we have all our dependencies. For this cloud function that we are going to, to develop today, we are going to translate a text into a specific language. For that, we have a library from Google, Google Cloud Translate. And let's see how easy to, is it to write a cloud function and deploy it. First, we are going to initialize our client. Then we are going to write a HTTP function. We are going to call it translate text. And like an HTTP, we'll have a request and a response. And for, for this function, we are going to send as query params two things, the text you want to translate and in which language to translate it. So we are going to get the text from the query params. Okay. And the target. And now we are going to call the function from our client to translate the text into the target for, for this target. And because it's a promise, we, it's going to uh, give us uh, the result asynchronously. So we have to wait for it. And then we are going to send the results. And if you have an error, we are going to send the error to show it on the response. A nice thing about cloud functions, and if you use Google services, is that you don't need to authenticate the client. We can see here that we just uh, in instantiated the client, but we don't need to provide any pet to our client secret or client ID, because in the cloud, Google will do that automatically for us. So now let's see how easy it is to deploy this function. OK, so to deploy the, the function, we are going to use Google CLI. We are specified that we want to deploy a function. Our function will be named translate text. And now we can see that in our application, we wrote off our function into index.js, which, which is the entry point in our application. And the function is called translate text. So here we are going to say that the entry point is translate text. The runtime in which the application runs is Node.js 8. It's a trigger HTTP. And we can also specify uh, the time, the maximum time it should take. We can say that we want it time out after 30 seconds. And the memory, is, it shouldn't use more than 128 megabytes. And now our function is going to deploy in the cloud, and it shouldn't take more than two minutes. As you can see, it's very easy to deploy a cloud function, and after that, we are going to be able to enter and make a request to that endpoint automatically. So it, it's very easy. I hope the internet is working. So you saw that we didn't install any dependencies. We, we didn't run npm install or something. Google does that for us. So we just need to provide an index.js and a package.json, and he will know all the stuff.
ok uh, translate this is usual when you present the demo live so I know you know that. Okay, uh, we will move forward. We will we will test our function because it already we already deployed in this morning. We can see that for the function we sent a query parameter text. We send a query param, hello, how are you, and the target, Italy, and we can also translate in Japanese if you want, and in any language. So yeah, so this is how easy it is to write a cloud function. Just three lines of code, and then you deploy it. Okay, now we want to move forward and see how BigQuery is working. Okay, so Razvan presented us what we will use for storing our files, for computing our data, and for uh, communicating between our serverless functions. But the main purpose of our application is to process a lot of data. And for that, we need a data warehouse. So this is where BigQuery comes, Big comes in place. BigQuery is a serverless data warehouse. And as all the uh, serverless technologies, you only pay for the resources that you use. And uh, you don't need a database administrator to manage the infrastructure of, for you. It's highly scalable, and you can write uh, standard SQL or legacy SQL, and the, free, uh, the first terabyte of data is free to analyze, and you can store 10 gigabytes of data for free um, per month. Now that we know what BigQuery is, uh, let's see how we can write a simple query. We have a table that has 8 million rows. Here we have a source ID, a destination ID, HOD, which is the hour of the day, and the mean travel time, standard devi deviation time, and so on. Let's say we want to make a query to get all the pets from which the travel time, the mean travel time is more than 15 minutes at 5 p.m., and we want to order them in a descending order. We can see how uh, we can write a query, a normal SQL query, and the execution time is really slow, uh, small. It's 500 milliseconds. Now, I know you are wondering, well, what if you have a very complex query? Because in our application, we process a lot of data, and we don't want to wait if the query takes 20 minutes. We don't want to wait 20 minutes until it's done. But BigQuery has a really nice feature. It, for each query that you run, it will create a job for that query, and uh, it can run asynchronously, and then you just need to query the status of that job. So we are going to do that in our demo today as well, because it's a good practice, and you can process a lot of data by doing that. You don't need to wait for the response. And the query will output this data into another table. Okay, so now that we know how our pipeline looks like and what technologies we are going to use, let's jump into our code and see how our pipeline is structured. We can see here we have four serverless functions. The first function will be triggered when we upload the file into our application. The second function will aggregate some data. The third function will check the, if our, the data was aggregated. Like I said in the previous slide, we can only query the status of the job to see if our query is done. And our final function will update the average travel time. So let's go into more detail in, into each function.
Here we can see our first function. You can see that it's very small and has only one purpose. You should view your cloud functions as having an input and an output. It should be like a black box. You just input something and then you get a result. So here, because this function is triggered when a file is uploaded to Google Cloud Storage, we get as uh, parameters some data. In that data, we can see the bucket our file was uploaded to, the file name, and we can get a reference to that file. Here we configure some metadata for our uh, upload to BigQuery, and then we just use the BigQuery client and tell the data set where we want to upload our data, in which table we want it to be uploaded, and what do we want to load. We want to load the file with, that was just updated with this metadata. And uh, in the metadata, we specify that the file is a CSV, and we want to auto-detect uh, the columns, because we, uh, you can specify the columns if you know exactly how your data looks like, but you can also let BigQuery figure that out for you. Okay, so let's see our next function. I forgot to say that at the end of the first function, we create the cloud task, so we go to our next step of the pipeline. Here we can see how easy it is to create the cloud task. We just specify the queue we want the task to be uh, put in, and the URL we want it to uh, ping, and the data. And here we are just creating a cloud task, and we can specify also as a, a parameter in how many seconds we want it to run. If you don't specify anything, it will run instantly. And by using, again, uh, the client from Google, we create a cloud task that will be automatically placed in the queue in the cloud. And now let's see how we aggregate data. That task will ping this cloud function after the first step of our pipeline is finished. So here we get the request and the response. We know the data set in which we placed our data and the table ID. And now we just make a query with another table we have in our data set in BigQuery to aggregate that data. And we uh, specify the destination table name where we want to place the result of the query because we want to run it asynchronously. And then we create a query job. Creating a query job is very easy. We just specify the query where we want to place the results and if sh it should truncate the results or append them. And after that, we create a cloud task to check the status of that query. We want to see it when it's finished. We can see that this function is also very small. We, it has only one purpose, to check the status of the query if the status is done, then we want to create another cloud task to update the final data. And if the query is not done yet, we create another cl uh, cloud task to query that table in five seconds. If you know that your query is very complex, you can uh, check the status one, at one minute or two minutes. It doesn't matter. You can specify that. And the final step of our pipeline is to update the final results. So we have here a query that gets the data from the new file and uploads the data in the final destination file where we uh, keep the updated data. For this, we also create a query job, but we don't wait and uh, we don't create another check status because we, it's the last step of our pipeline. So when the data will be uploaded, we will see it on the front end application. And now this one will uh, show us how we can uh, another service from Google Cloud run because we can see that with Cloud Functions we can write them only in Node.js and in Python or Go, so we are a little bit limited. Okay, so we saw how easy it is to write a Cloud Function, now how easy it is to deploy one. But we have a problem. What about we have a new developer in our company and he doesn't know Node.js, Python or Go? And we need to build another step in our pipeline. Well, our new developer knows Perl, so what he can do? He needs to, to, be, to develop a serverless step. Well, Google addressed this issue, and, and they just released uh, Cloud Run in a beta version. Cloud Run brings stateless container to the serverless world. So what you need to do is just create a Docker container, which is stateless, and give it to Google. And then Google will automatically attach a, a domain and we'll scale the container based on the request that comes in. 
Also, the, the pricing is the same as Cloud Function, so are you only paying for the time the request is proceed, or, um, uh, and you're not paying when the app is scaling up, scaling up or scaling down? With this, you can write any, in, any, in any framework, in any language, in any, with any dependency, you can write serverless uh, code. So let's see how, how it looks like an API uh, <laughs> written and deployed uh, using Cloud Run. So we have here the API, which is a Node.js app. It will, it will just query the BigQuery, and that's it and show some data, uh, and it's just an express app. We have a Docker image. It's the Docker image official, official Docker image from NPM. And we see that we don't have any configuration file. We, don't have, we, we just have the code, and that's it. So if you right now have a, a Docker, Docker, Docker image with uh, an API, you just you can deploy to Google easily. So let's see how it's easily to deploy. So first, uh, right now, Google supports uh, images from cloud uh, repository, which is a, a Docker container repository from Google. But in the future, they will add more repositories like Docker Hub or your own repository. First, you need to, we need to build your image and submit to, to cloud repository for, for our current project. After the image is submitted, we will deploy the image to Cloud Run. And you can see that uh, we specified the service name, which is API, the image that we want to deploy from Cloud Registry, the region. And also, you can say, uh, I want my service to be public or private. So uh, right now, our service is public, so everyone can, can call the API. But if you build a microservice uh, application, you, you can specify uh, the services uh, that, that want to be private. So they're not allowed to the open world. With, with this in mind, uh, you can create uh, any, any application without, without, uh, without knowing the specific language. Also, Cloud Run is built from Knative. So if you already have a, a, a Docker image which is running a Kubernetes cluster, you can take that image and put it on, on Cloud Run. It will scale automatically, and it, and it, it will work. OK, I, I already showed you our demo with, with Cloud Run and how to, you, you can deploy on Cloud Run. And this is, was our presentation. Uh, and if you have questions, please ask them right now. Why did you choose uh, Google as a service provider? I think we didn't choose Google. Google chose us. Uh, yeah, we, we started using Google because um, we st we st I think we started first with Amazon, and then we switched to Google because the documentation was much cleaner. And they uh, and then we 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 are stuck with Google <laughs> because we really like it. Yeah, and all the services from Google integrate really easy. Like we saw in our demo demo today, you can connect every service really easy and deploy your code to the cloud. Yes, the source code is available. We will send you, uh, we will post uh, the GitHub link here. And yeah, you can play with it. Is there can you any, see the, or let me. Is there any disadvantage in using serverless? Like, for instance, in the design phase, you know how your application will look like. So is there an indicator that would tell you that you need to use maybe a dedicated infrastructure or choose serverless? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, of course, there's advantages. You, you are literally stuck with Google. And that's why uh, right now Google tried to, to move 
the serverless uh, technologies into on-premise, so we combine them. But yeah, I think it's the, the main advantages. And you also you need to know very well your services that you want to use, because all the services have some code limitation and stuff. Hey, uh, I know that uh, Cloud Run is just beta, but did you guys have a chance to do uh, a testing on the impact of the cold starts on uh, Knative versus Cloud Functions? Actually, we didn't do uh, discussion testing. We test Cloud Run, uh, it's, and it's pretty pretty fast. It depends on your how many dependencies do you have, same as Cloud Functions. So if you have like 20 dependencies, yeah, the call start will be much bigger. So if you have like two or three dependencies, it will be like three, four seconds maximum. We are here after the demo, so we can talk more about serverless world after this. Thank you.